People can't be accountable or responsible for each other in mass society. Uh, but that's why, perhaps that's why that obtained for so long. It was working. You got 80 people and they are taking care of each other and they are accountable to each other. To me, that's what anarchism is. And if you can't do that, then the rest of it is kind of secondary. And that's the sad situation we're in. Anyway, Band Society uh, did, did last for an awfully long time. And we come to the stage very, very slowly via specialization or division of labor where the, where the uh, basic equality of band society starts to slip away. Inequalities arise, tensions begin, because some people uh, start to slowly get specialized roles, and that means they have some effective power over others. And perhaps the shaman is the first example of that. Because uh, shamans, in, some, in the ethnology, you can read how some of them exercised really a kind of political power. They might decide who lives and dies. They, they could really, for the first time, have that kind of authority, which generally was absent. And that division of labor, uh, that some of us feel this way, that led slowly to the point, just nine or 10,000 years ago, of domestication, which was very strongly resisted by people living more freely. In other words, domestication just worked for agriculture, for farming for private property, for class society. It all really emerges with that shift away from freely foraging, the hunter-gatherer life, which is not bounded, which private property doesn't exist in, uh, the objectification of women doesn't exist. And this, as Paul Shepard and more lately Spencer Wells and a number of other people have said, this is the worst mistake in human history. That turn it's just so basic and pivotal that then it's all about control, extorting from nature rather than receiving what nature uh, freely offers. And, uh, and very soon after domestication, you get civilization. They're almost synonymous. You, the domestication, uh, where that comes, then you, you rapidly get the first civilizations, the first empires, the first war, and all, and all the rest of it. The, uh, so if, that's, if that has something to do with today, well, let me just say it does, because you could probably ask any economist on Earth, what drives the world system? What drives the basic economy? Division of labor. It's not, it's not some anarchist point of view. That's just simple stuff. You know, it's just, that's true. And that keeps going, and it keeps driving the thing, and domestication as well. Uh, one of my favorite uh, thoughts on that is Paul Shepard, the late Paul Shepard, who's a kind of environmental philosopher. He said, when you think about genetic engineering and cloning and nanotechnology and robotics and all this great new world stuff right now, it's implicit in the first step. The move to domestication sets it all in motion. It's, it starts there and it goes, it'll go all the way to all these things now and even past that to the point that some people actually celebrate of the merger of, of humans and machine. And uh, I think it's right. Uh, anyway, that's kind of just a thumbnail thing about uh, primitivism. Mm -hmm. you just make, can you help for others, maybe, and I'd like to hear too from your mouth. Um, one further distinction, given how many folks here are taking the step to move toward growing your own food as opposed to buying from the global economy. So, where that distinction in the ancient world or even now between surplus agriculture that leads to condition of labor sets it right. Some people don't have to grow their own food because other people are going for them. And some kind of sustainable basic I don't just critique of the word sus um, um, uh, no subsistence agriculture, but there's some other term for this just enough to get you by from year to year with a little extra in case the weather's bad, but not enough to allow you to have a specialized culture. Well, it's kind of funny that that whole thing is a little history of itself in the in kind of, in, if you're part of the kind of in-group thing, but uh, when this, 
the primitivist things started coming on, there were people that were absolutely insistent on the gather hunter mode. Nothing, everything else is oppression. <laughs> you gotta, you know, don't, don't tell me about gardening. I mean, it was very absolutist, but I think now there's much greater awareness of horticulture that there are egalitarian horticultural societies. They're, they're commonly hunter-gatherer too, but they have domestication. And now there's a little more openness in the direction you're talking about. For example, the one nice example I think is, is forest horticulture in some various places in, in different countries where you couldn't see where is the garden. It isn't really bounded, but it is tended. And so that's obviously vastly different from an industrial monoculture where a whole state grows one strain of corn or something. And that's, that's the madness of now. But, uh, but I think there's still the idea that maybe that's a step toward the ultimate, ultimate goal of, of forager life, uh, even though there's a value in that, you know, and a total necessity. And if I could just put this in, the, the most common uh, rebuke or attack on, on the primitivist line of thinking, uh, as, as espoused by Noam Chomsky and uh, millions of other people, look, we've got seven billion people. It's just lunacy to talk about hunter-gatherer, how many people could that support? Fair point. And that's where, that's where there has to be transitional moves. There has to be steps, practical uh, steps and process to go in that direction. Nobody's talking about, bang, you know, it's all over, we pull the plug, and there's no more nothing, no factories, no mining, no nothing. I, I, nobody would say that. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense. And, but my question for those people who are saying that, why are there 7 billion people? That starts with domestication. The unnatural population did not spike until domestication. That's what's driving it. And you're, you're only making it worse by feeding it. There's 7 billion, how about 10 billion? You just want to keep on this path, this suicidal path. And uh, just one more thing on that. Uh, when I was in Brazil, and I've lost the copy, I used to, I used to wave this around some, uh, there was a great big uh, gathering of, uh, of anarchists in Sao Paulo, and I was uh, fortunate to be able to be a part of that three years ago or something. And some of the some of the folks there had made a booklet, it's in Portuguese, I can't even think of the title now, but the cover graphic showed these figures going up this uh, incline, and then just going over the edge, you're just going over the cliff. And the, and, the gra and the caption was, we've come this far, we can't go back now. <laughs> and so when it was my turn to talk, I just held it up and I said, I don't know what else to add. This, is, uh, this says it all, kind of, you know, this is the deal. I mean, this is perfect. You know, of course, I went on to do a lot of yakking after that. But, you know. There are uh, uh, a number of, of uh, social scientists that are now predicting that uh, the real population of the planet by 2100 will be around 1 billion. So we're looking at a total collapse of population uh, with you know, uh, potentially happening from pandemic and other kinds of things. How does that kind of play into all of this? I mean, well, that's, uh, I mean, who knows? But the, yeah, there's all kinds of grisly predictions. Uh, but, you know, the way I look at it, who is concerned about all these billions of people? You know, I've been in some of these cities, and you don't have to go real far, but I mean, the mega cities of the world, these tower blocks, people have been forced off the land, that's the, that's the meaning of civilization, uh, really. Uh, what about them? If, when it crashes, and more, more, more and more and more people think it's a matter of when, not if, they're going to be dead in a few days. They have no skills. They, the food's going to rot. They get, where's the water coming from? I mean. Are you, Professor Chomsky, are you really so concerned about them? I mean, we're very concerned. That's, that's going to be, that's the catastrophe writ large. I mean, let's work on that. Let's reskill ourselves. People used to walk on this earth fully capable of, of everything they needed without all this stuff. And, and uh, can, is there some way we can start moving back in that direction? 
if you want to say back. I know some people don't like to put it that way, but we can't just keep going this way. I think you were next. Um, yeah. Uh, when we talk about population um, on, the, on the global level, can you um, speak up? I mean, yeah, sorry. When we talk about uh, globalization, uh, population on the global level, one of the uh, biggest concerns I have, especially when talking about environmentalists and ecological perspective, is how racialized that talk can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, and where are the alternatives? Are we offering alternatives? No, no we're not. I mean, we, it's, you know, you can't expect people to uh, just, you know, go there without any, I mean, we, we've got to try to all uh, make that possible. And so, I don't know, there's a lot of different ways to put that, but yeah, it's not, uh, you know, skill is making soap. And I learned it by doing it. I mean, we're, we're gardening and, and gathering wood and, and a few things, but one thing I've really uh, seen, and I've had some folks on the radio show, for example, that when you go out, and uh, and it still seems kind of nutty, when you, I mean, I, I don't think it's nutty whatsoever to learn how to make a fire, to what plants are edible, I mean, that's, that's pretty basic, important stuff. But talking to those people, I see them uh, empowered in a way that if you don't have those skills, because you have the autonomy. 
and it, and it makes sense. If you want to if you want to pull down the structure, but you don't know how to cope afterwards, you're going to maybe be reluctant to pull it down. You know, but how do we walk out of this uh, madness and uh, have a better life? You know, know what to do. Um, There's, uh, I, I just have one thing on the subject, and it's uh, the table there. There's some uh, about patriarchy. Yeah, and uh, gender origins. Because I think that uh, it's, to me, it's pretty close to equate patriarchy and civilization uh, in, in a lot of ways. And that's, uh, and just, to, I can't help but mention something about Donna Haraway. I, I once interviewed her, and uh, it was civil, but, uh, you know, the way I read her is uh, the way to get around the gender uh, oppression and sexism is when we all become machines. There won't be no gender. That's, that's like a, tech, that's a techno-fascist solution. That's a solution, but, gee, is that, that's, uh, that's it. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope we can do better than that. I mean, that's basically what you're saying, I think. Yeah, and I guess, I guess also sort of beyond the idea of the patriarchy and like the origins of patriarchy, which I think you do a really great job of, um, just in terms of sexuality as something not necessarily the same as gender, you know, if there's any theorizing sort of in that space. I think it's been interesting for me um, in, in working with different museum projects having the opportunity to work in some native communities and just observing gender roles um, and sexuality actually being kind of a matter of humor and joking as opposed to this display that sort of permeates our culture now um, and, and how the gender balances or you know been worked out over a long long time so that people really seem to share power in a healthy way the um, obtrusive part being imposed structures such as tribal councils for example maybe that doesn't address your question but i can relate to that from that experience what what are you thinking along those lines um, I guess, it, yeah, I mean, I guess I was just wondering if there, if there was work going on in that as separating sexuality from gender or as nuanced as like something different than just gender. And I, I do know in a limited sort of study of, of native sexuality that there was much more sort of multiplicity across the board in terms of, uh, you know, there were, there were categories for people's sexuality and what we might call transgender people now or queer people now, you know or consider people with two spirits or something, and they hold a different sort of position of honor. You know, I'm just wondering where that comes into, because I feel like the people who are doing work on sexuality and maybe um, exploding those binaries are coming at it from uh, a standpoint like down here or something where technology is, is central to it. So I was just looking for another, and because I know that that exists in, in a lot of Native culture, but I don't know how it's being carried over into here. I mean, Day. 
I, I don't think there's a whole lot. I, I, there's really a whole lot on parenting, but I, I just, I'm not too aware of a whole lot on that. There's one page in Species Trade 4. Trader 4, it's out there. There's a piece by Colin Turnbull, uh, lived with the Mbuti, and he, he mentions uh, uh, a few things in there. And uh, to add to that is that uh, one of the reasons why um, people in the so-called South uh, reproduce so much is because they themselves are the resources for the North. So that's the only investment they can have is to have more human resources to be consumed by the consumers. So here, when you concentrate wealth, it's actually um, more profitable to have less children because then you don't disperse the wealth. But when you yourself is the wealth, well, it's better to have many of you because then. So that's, that also works into this. Uh, just to complement your point. Um, we have, technically, we have time for only one more comment. Um, I think John and Alex are going to hang out a little bit while we are trying to clean um, and get ready for the show at the next location at 9 p.m. So we'll have uh, Sarah have the last question and John and Alex have the last word and um, I'll give some instructions. And Sort of asking what is our actual connection with native folks? Or, uh, or anyone, like any group of people who are kind of closer mm -hmm. to the space that you're talking about, in what ways have you personally engaged people in that, or what are the reactions to your ideas from native people in India that you're talking to? Or? Uh, you know, I don't know. That, uh, we, we know some native folks who call us neo primitivists, and I, I think that's not a I think it's not a pejorative. Uh, as you probably know, there, there's, a, there's a very, uh, often a very pronounced and totally justified reaction against wannabes or people who would appropriate uh, a culture for their own, whatever it is, their own ideas, their own agenda, and uh, try very hard not to do that. And when I mentioned that, uh, Early on, I kind of 
mentioned the what's going on in Arizona, and uh, I know a little more about that than my reference to BC, where in terms of tactics, in terms of struggle, that's that's one thing that's that's hopeful that there can be uh, a coming together. And you know how much of it rests on the primitivist ideas as we in in a very you know, basically Eurocentric starting point, even though we're not interested in that tradition in, in the sense of uh, valuing what, how successful various indigenous life ways have been, how, how really spectacularly successful they were and stable, uh, holding out against so many things for so long. It's, it's just remarkable. But in terms of but you don't, you wouldn't have to be a primitivist, though, either, to be in common cause with uh, whatever indigenous project it might be. But I think it's it's more likely because when I see there there are people, there certainly are people on the left who are engaged in that, who are trying to help, who are trying to be in alliance. But you know, their whole philosophy, I think, fundamentally, is counter to that because they are, they believe in progress. They, they don't, as, as in a philosophical plan anyway, they don't respect the indigenous, uh, the, that, that dimension or that integrity. They, you know, they want them to move on, to be modern, to be workers, to be consumers, to be political citizens. Well, what if you don't want that? What if you think they had it right, they were figuring it out, I mean, and I'm speaking very generally, but outside of domestication, Wow, they had all this egalitarianism, they, they, they had a society based on sharing, you know, all, all those things, and that's just a textbook of anthropology, by the way, that's just a textbook, there's no, there's no, that's not, you know, making up a, a nice picture to pin your stuff on it, and we go off into that a little more, but, uh, but as I said before, there's no reason for a lot of trust, I mean, my God, what is the record of, of the original people versus the, the rest of us? I mean, there's no basis for it. But so, they're, they're, what, what we can learn and what we can do together, you know, would probably be a slow deal. But there has been some stuff that I find really wonderful and just, just tremendously heartening. I can't think of anything that would be more exciting than, than some of those connections that are maybe going to go forward, who knows, but they're going somewhere now, I think. And that's what primitivism is, just like primitivism also in a practical way is people fighting dams, fighting the, the high-speed trains. And I'm not saying they call themselves that, uh, where whatever country, almost certainly they don't, but that's the real thing, you know, that's what they're doing. They're not, oh, we got to have more progress, more technology, more factories. There are people fighting that all over the world, you know, not just some anarchist primitivists, you know.
I'm angry, I'm torn Look around, the sheep are shorn I'm fat and naked Like a man that's just been born But I'm nothing new And covered in the blood and wool That's scattered on the shearing floor I am murder, I am shame But I open my eyes while you prayed and saw a vision of Land your shepherds raised up oh, Martyrs blown with smarter bombs But they're not ours so nothing's wrong And tanks are rolling, oil spilled